Ethics and the Law, Applications in the NICU, by Dr. Adam DeTora. Hi, everyone. My name is Adam DeTora. I'm a, an assistant clinical professor at the University of California in San Francisco. I'm here today to talk about ethics and the law and how they apply to cases in the NICU. Here's my outline. I'll go through uh, the introduction. I'll talk about a theoretical case example and then review some statutory laws that are applicable to neonatal practice and then some specific case laws. We'll go through an analysis of the case and then some conclusions at the end. So medical decisions in the NICU follow legal and ethical considerations. There are most cases, most times that we're practicing in the NICU, we're not thinking about the relevant laws that apply to our practice because most of our decisions are based off of ethical decisions. But the law is important to consider. So the law is a system of rules that regulate behavior. And this is unique to different societies, countries, states, and cities. At any given time, there are many different layers of laws that regulate our behavior. On the other hand, uh, ethics is a system of moral principles and frameworks applied to the practice of medicine. And there are different types of systems. Most commonly used is sort of principalism, which covers beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, and justice. But there are other systems that are applied, and these help clarify values, judgments, and preferences both on the patient side as well as the physician side. Now, when we're working in the NICU, we primarily think about these main ethical principles, and there's a spectrum of cases that we commonly encounter. Patients often fall on the side of receiving care that's clearly beneficial, whereas sometimes care is clearly harmful. So for example, a depressed full-term neonate who's not breathing at birth, who receives positive pressure ventilation, is, that's clearly a beneficial treatment that the patient receives, as opposed to a patient with a life-limiting condition or who is at end-of-life care with a terminal illness, continued intensive life care therapies may not be beneficial. Now, there are some cases that are complicated and most of these cases I find are when physicians and parents disagree with the appropriateness of medical care. And some of these cases require analysis of relevant statutory and case laws to help uh, figure out what's the best thing to do in that situation. So here's an example of a case, just a theoretical case. So if you're the NICU fellow on call and you're called to the pediatric emergency department to assist with a resuscitation. There's a female patient brought in, she's 30 years old, she's brought in by ambulance complaining of abdominal pain. It turns out she's in active labor and she's had no prenatal care, there's unknown gestational age of the infant. There's a subsequent vaginal delivery of a non-vigorous, what appears to be an extremely preterm infant. Now the pediatric emergency department team starts a resuscitation and your team arrives at about a minute of life and assumes uh, control of the code. And in the few seconds you have as you're assessing the situation, you wonder, is there a legal or ethical obligation to provide resuscitation in this situation? For example, is there an emergency medical condition or emergency medical treatment indicated? So let's review some of the relevant statutory laws. And what is a statutory law? This is a written law that's created by the government via legislation. So there are different types of legislative bodies, state and federal. So federal laws apply nationally and state laws apply to certain states and usually doesn't contradict with federal laws although there are some caveats to that. So an example of a statutory law is EMTALA which is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. This was a federal law passed by Congress in 1986 and this ensured patients have access to emergency medical care regardless of the ability to pay. So at the time there was a lot of dumping of patients from one hospital to another prior to admission to the emergency department especially those patients who didn't have health insurance, and so this prevented that. And it requires a couple conditions, a screening, medical examination to identify any emergency medical condition, which is, then needs to be stabilized before the patient's transferred to either a different area of the hospital or to a different hospital. And this law actually includes specific text that addresses treatment of labor and delivery of the fetus and placenta. On the other hand, case laws are judicial decisions for a certain case that then sets a precedent and becomes a law. Now, there are many different courts, state courts, district courts, supreme courts, and so the specific decision or holdings of a court apply only to that certain uh, jurisdiction. And the details of each individual case are quite specific, and depending on how these cases are interpreted, they can be applied differently to different situations. Finding an example in which case law is the only type of law applied in neonatology is difficult. In the case of Montalvo v. Borkovic from 1996, both concepts from statutory law and case law were applied. 
In this case, an infant was born at 23 weeks due to unstoppable preterm labor. After several years, the parents discovered the infant had neurodevelopmental impairment and sued the hospital for violating informed consent in which they claimed that they were not informed of the risks associated with an extremely preterm infant. The case went through the trial court as well as the Wisconsin State Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals have supported the hospital, and they utilized the current version of the Baby Doe regulations as well as common law concepts such as surrogate decision-making for an incompetent person. They recognize that parents are not wholly responsible for every decision, that physicians also have a role. In their assessment of the case, they referred to a previous Supreme Court case in which decision-making for an incompetent patient had set precedent. When we think about decision-making for infants, it's helpful to think first, well, how, how are decisions made for adults? Adults are considered autonomous, and they can consent or refuse medical treatments. And this goes sort of way back, and I've highlighted a couple of interesting court cases here. So Schloendorf versus Society of New York Hospital in 1914, one of the quotes from the holdings was that every human being of adult years and sound mind has the right to determine what shall be done with his own body. A more contemporary example is Cruzan versus Director in Missouri Department of Health in the 1990s, which the court held that the patient generally possesses the right not to consent, that is, to refuse treatment. Now, for infants, infants are minors. They lack capacity and are incompetent uh, in the eyes of the law. So we rely on surrogate decision-making. And parents are the appropriate surrogate in most situations. In the uh, case of baby K, which was a baby who was born with uh, anencephaly, whose mother continued to request intensive care therapies, every time the patient you know, presented to the emergency department was intubated for respiratory distress, and the court found that absent finding of neglect or abuse, parents retain plenary authority to seek medical care for their child, even when the decision might impinge on the liberty interests of the child. So for babies, and for, for many pediatric patients, decisions are made following a best interest standard. And this is defined differently, depending on where you look, but it, there are attempted legal interpretations of this. And it's usually when the preference is unknown, we need to weigh the risks and benefits of the treatment, the outcomes of potential harms and burdens, and have a joint conversation with the family to help clarify what their values and preferences are in order to make decisions for the infant. There are limitations to parental authority, and way far back in the 1940s in Prince versus Massachusetts, uh, a quote from the judge was, parents are free to become martyrs themselves, but it does not follow that they are free in identical circumstances to make martyrs of their children before they have reached the age of full and legal discretion when they can make that choice for themselves. Currently, the legal age of majority is 18. And this particular case was talking about child labor laws, but really helped us think about what is the state's role in the protection of children. Now, in the early 2000s, there was a case, Miller versus HCA, in which a very early preterm baby was born at about 23 weeks and was resuscitated against parental wishes. And later on, the parents sued because the child had a severe neurodevelopmental impairment. Initially, the parents were awarded like $60 million, but this was subsequently overturned. And in overturning the decision, the judge in this case stated, although parents have a right to determine health care decisions for their children, this is not an absolute right, and the state also has an interest in the health of children. Now, there are many limitations to parental authority, and an example of a statutory law is the Baby Doe Amendments, which is part of the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, or CAPTA. And this particular amendment aimed to prevent the withholding of medically indicated treatment from disabled infants with life-threatening conditions. And really, this was brought about in the early 1980s after several cases uh, were brought to trial uh, in New York with children with trisomy 21 or uh, myelomeningocele, in which treatment was withheld from the infant because of projected future disabilities. So now let's review some of the other federal statutory laws that are relevant to neonatal practice. There's the Section 504 of the Rehabil Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which prevents discrimination of persons with disabilities, and see also the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is from 1990. There's the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act and the Baby Doe Amendments, which really aim to identify, treat, and prevent child abuse, and provided this legal definition of what abuse and neglect are. It prevents discrimination and withholding of treatment for infants with disabilities, 
for example, purely based on disability alone for an infant with trisomy 21. We had previously talked about the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. Then there's also this other act, this Born Alive Infant Protection Act, which was passed in 2002. So it's interesting to look at the specific text of this law, and I'll read sections A and B. In determining the meaning of any act of Congress or of any ruling, regulation, or interpretation of the various administrative bureaus and agencies of the United States, the word person, human being, child, and individual shall include every infant member of the species Homo sapiens who is born alive at any stage of development. As used in this section, the term born alive with respect to a member of the species Homo sapiens means the complete expulsion or extraction from his or her mother of that member at any stage of development, who, after such expulsion or extraction, breathes or has a beating heart, pulsation of the umbilical cord, or definite movement of voluntary muscles, regardless of whether the umbilical cord has been cut, and regardless of whether the expulsion or extraction occurs as a result of natural or induced labor, cesarean section, or induced abortion. So those words are very concerning as a neonatologist because when this law was passed, people were very worried that it would apply to situations in which it was clear that care was either futile or potentially harmful or inappropriate. For example, an 18-week fetus who has no chance of survival, but if was born via spontaneous abortion or a medical abortion and had a beating heart, would be considered a person. So there were a lot of comments and concerns around the time this law was passed, and people were concerned that the law didn't define normative neonatal practice or what the standard medical care should be. At the time, this was passed with sort of a referendum or a whole sort of fine print. It's hard to access, but the law would not require treatment for all conditions, for example, pre-viable infants or for fatal conditions. And it really just ensured that all infants born are considered persons under federal law and thus have all the rights uh, afforded to them. Given the exact legal definitions that was proposed in this law, um, uh, some researchers out in California sent out the survey in 2009 to all current neonatologists practicing in California, and they got about a 44% response rate. And more than 50% of neonatologists had never even heard of this law, and a very small minority of them thought that this law represented the standard of care, very few thought that this was an evidence-based law, and over 90% thought this law would lead to overly aggressive treatment of infants who will not survive. Now, after this law had passed, there was some concern that the courts would prosecute any situation in which care was withheld from children, but there has never been a case that has actually been challenged or brought to trial based off this law. But this law still exists. So let's move on to some case laws that are relevant to neonatal practice. Now I've highlighted just a couple of cases and um, there's actually a, a paper that I wrote back in 2015 that has a few more cases in sort of a table format that you can check out. But the baby doe cases are interesting because there was one in 1982 and one in 1983. The one in 1982 was an infant born with trisomy 21 that had a esophageal atresia and a tracheoesophageal fistula. And back in the 80s, surgery was available to correct this anatomic defect. However, after counseling from uh, various physicians, a family decided to withhold surgery, and this was presumably based off of the concern for intellectual disability associated with trisomy 21. The infant subsequently died of pneumonia at six days of life, and the Indiana Ju Juvenile Court upheld the parent's decision to withhold treatment, even though there was a district attorney who wanted to challenge this and force treatment for the child. So this would never happen these days. We would never withhold care uh, from a child with trisomy 21, specifically based off of the trisomy 21 aspect of it, because of the range of clinical outcomes and in intellectual ability or disability. Uh, a second case in 1983, there was a baby that was born with a myelomeningocele, had hydrocephalus, and again, similar situation in which the parents were counseled, there was a strong likelihood of intellectual disability, and so the parents opted for non-surgical correction which nowadays would be unheard of because it leads to permanent injury to the spinal cord and sort of just worse quality of life, worse outcomes. And so they chose uh, bandaging and antibiotics even though there was spinal cord contents exposed. And at this time, uh, again, the parent's decision was challenged and the New York State Supreme Court held, upheld the parent's decision to do a non-surgical intervention approach. This child did live for some, some time afterwards. So both of these cases actually led to the creation of the baby doe amendments under, under the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. 
There was a case in the early 90s, the messenger case, where an infant was born at 26 weeks. The parents requested no resuscitation, and the infant was resuscitated against parental wishes, admitted to the NICU. And in this case, remarkably, the father personally extubated the child, handed it to the mother, and allowed the infant to die in the mother's arms. And the father was actually tried for manslaughter and was acquitted. And this is a very rare situation. And again, remembering all these case laws only apply to the specific jurisdiction in which the court heard the case. But this is a really interesting situation to show just how important parents feel about being involved in the decision making for their infants. Now, I find this case particularly interesting. I talked about it a little bit earlier. It's a Miller versus HCA. And in this case, there was a baby that was born at 23 weeks and parents requested no resuscitation. They received appropriate counseling. There was a plan with the team at the time to offer no resuscitation. But there was this hospital policy that existed that mandated resuscitation of infants born at greater than 500 grams. And the baby was born on a night in which that sort of initial conversation with that team wasn't around. So the baby was actually resuscitated against parental wishes, survived, and several years later was discovered to have severe neurodevelopmental impairment. The parents sued the hospital for battery and initially won $60 million, but the Texas Appellate Court overturned the decision. And a quote from that holding is that, parents have no right to refuse urgently needed life-sustaining medical treatment to their non-terminally ill children. So this is unfortunate sequence of events because the parents were appropriately counseled and in this day in many hospitals we would support no resuscitation or non-intervention for a baby born at this gestational age. It's still within the parental uh, parental rights to request that. Now those are some examples of cases which are sort of life and death decisions and there are other examples in which ethics and the law converge sort of everyday examples. So some frequent situations that I've encountered are, can infants born to mothers with substance abuse be tested for drug screening against parental consent? This has, you know, ethical and legal implications and can it really affect the care of a child, uh, if, especially if we're watching for withdrawal of, of a baby whose mom was using uh, a narcotic that's long acting. Can parents refuse vitamin K, erythromycin, state metabolic screening or immunizations or other routine medical interventions that are have very low risk of harm to the patient and have high chances of benefiting that patient. Now what about can parents refuse a lumbar puncture for a neonate with bacteremia and sepsis? It would be really helpful medically to know what organism is causing the infection. It changes the length of and duration of therapy and partially treating meningitis could be detrimental to the baby. However, parents could, could legally refuse this procedure in many situations. For infants with life-limiting conditions like trisomy 18, can physicians refuse to provide life-sustaining medical treatment? Most of these babies or children will die before age one. A lot of them have chronic medical conditions or heart disease, and there's a real non-intervention approach uh, historically. But nowadays, parents are requesting a lot more intervention for these children. And who are we to say that having 30 days or 100 days or six months with their child with a life-limiting condition isn't meaningful for them? And lastly, I really struggle with this question. Can surgical palliation be withheld from infants born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome? The advances in surgical care over the last three decades have really shown that children with this condition can live for multiple decades. And should we really be offering palliative care from the beginning, a non-surgical approach, which usually means a, a much shorter lifespan for these patients. So let's go back to the case we talked about in the beginning. So to remind everybody, this was a mom who presented to the emergency department without any prenatal care, and she delivers an extremely preterm infant in the emergency department. And resuscitation is already started by the time the NICU team arrives at about a minute of life. So this is an unfortunate situation in which the periviability counseling just didn't happen. And because it's an emergency situation, and given the lack of information, one could conclude that an emergency condition existed, and perhaps EMTALA applies here, that the patient needs to be attempted to be stabilized prior to transferring the patient to a different area of the hospital. So a trial of resuscitation would seem reasonable in this situation to see if the baby would respond. And according to the neonatal resuscitation program, you know, if a baby has a systole or doesn't respond to appropriate medical interventions within about 10 minutes, or 15 minutes, then it would be reasonable to call the code and redirect care at that point. But 
Trialing this resuscitation allows for more time to gather information and then perhaps counsel the family and explore their preferences afterwards. Now remember, ethically, withholding and withdrawal of life-sustaining medical treatment is ethically equivalent and thus would be ethically permissible. If we would, from the beginning, have allowed non-intervention and palliative care, then withdrawal of you know, mechanical ventilation or artificial nutrition hydration would be ethically permissible in this case. Some conclusions from this lecture are that the ethics and the law often intersect. Even though we don't think about the law every day, many of our ethical principles go hand in hand with the law. There are many cases that are clear cut. Medical care is beneficial in many situations in which we'll walk into as neonatologists. However, other cases are not. And in these cases, best interests, expected burdens and benefits, as well as family preferences are used to guide decisions. We've really swung from an autonomous model or a uh, paternalistic model back to uh, a shared decision-making model that we try to practice. And parental authority is well supported by ethical frameworks and laws. Parental authority is not absolute, however, and laws exist to prevent child abuse, neglect, and ensure that minors receive appropriate medical care. Physicians should become familiar with relevant federal and state laws that apply to their medical practice. Now, federal laws are easier to search on the internet for, but I find it actually very difficult to tease apart the details of the state laws that apply to where, wherever I'm practicing. So I recommend that you don't act in isolation for complex cases. Consult with colleagues. There are ethics committees and hospital legal counsel that can help you sort through some of these difficult cases, especially when the medical team and parents disagree with what the appropriateness of medical care is for their child. So thanks for listening to my presentation on ethics and the law.